Good morning, and welcome to the Woods Church Chesterfield Church Online. We are so glad that you have decided to worship along with us this morning. Maybe this is your first time tuning in, or you've been worshiping with us for a few weeks. If you have yet to connect, I encourage you, text the word CONNECT to 586-200-1785. That way you can learn a little bit more of who we are here at the Woods Church and the ministries that we have available. I also want to ask you to go ahead and hit that share button on whatever social media platform you are watching on. Many of you also received a link in a text message to these worship services. Go ahead and forward that on because the truth is, is that you never know the impact of that one small move that it can have. There are many people in your circles that would love to worship with us this morning that would benefit from hearing God's word. So go ahead and hit that share button. We also wanted to let you know how much we miss you. We miss seeing you in person. And so we invite you to come back. We are in person at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. right here at our Chesterfield campus. There's something about being in community. We were made for community and we were made for connection. And so being able to worship together and open God's word together, it does something amazing. So we invite you, come on back on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. here at a Chesterfield campus. We also wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much for those of you who have continued to be generous during these unprecedented times. We're very excited about what God's going to do in our relationship and partnership with the Anchor Bay School District. So thank you. It's because of your generosity that we can continue to make an impact well beyond the walls of our church. And so if you have yet to connect with us that way, there are some really easy ways for you to be able to give. You can text a dollar amount to 84321. You can also utilize the Give button on the Church Center app or you can visit the website, thewoodschurch.org slash give. Thank you so much for your continued generosity. And as we go into a time of worship, let's just prepare our hearts for what God is going to do in us and through us this morning. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much that we have the opportunity to gather together, whether it's in person or it's online and in our homes, um, Lord, just to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. So God, during these times where things seem so uncertain and, and look different, God, we know that the truth is, is that you have not changed, that you are not different. And so God, we stand on that truth and we stand on that solid ground. So God, may everything that we say, everything that we do, may you be worshiped. May you be glorified this morning. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, wherever you are this morning, uh, we are so glad that you are with us. We're going to worship together. Would you stand wherever you are and uh, lift up the name of Jesus Christ with us this morning in this place.
sing it every season. this morning. sing this together. And I know a breakthrough is coming by faith. I see a miracle. My God has made me a promise and he won't stop now. And I know a breakthrough is coming by faith. And I've seen a miracle. My God has made me a promise and he won't stop now. Such a truth that we declare this morning that, um, that there is a miracle that can always be taking place um, if only we look. Um, you know, I can know, I can know with, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that when I look back on my life, there have been miracles that have taken place and things that are only done through the presence of God and in the presence of God. And so as we continue to worship together this morning, I would hope um, whatever place you find yourself at today, whether it's physically in, in a church, whether it's um, watching us online, whatever it may be, my prayer for you is that, that you know that God is working in your life, that you know is, that God is working in the lives of people around you, and it may not always seem like it, it may not always feel like it, it may not always look like it, um, 
But I can tell you that when we know and lean on that truth, we can look back and see the miracles of what God has done and his working hand in our lives. And, uh, you know, my prayer for you, again, as we continue uh, to worship this morning is that that would be the truth that you lean on this morning, not the truth of what you may see on TV, not the truth of what you may hear um, on the radio or in a podcast, but that you would lean into the truth of God, knowing that um, in his presence and in his power, miracles happen and um, that he is that he is always, always, always working, even if it may not feel or seem like it. And so again, as we continue to worship, I would pray that that would be your heart um, and that you reflect on that for just these next moments as we continue in worship together this morning. As I walk now through the valley, let your love rise above every fear. Like the sun shaping the shadow in my weakness, your glory appears. Come on, we declare this this morning, church. Sing it out.
lift your voices and sing this morning. Sing it out. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? I'm not enough, not enough, unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me and I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. This morning, lift us up.
this together. Sing, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For in this days we will sing your praise, oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. God, this morning we, at least my hope, my prayer for each of us, whether we are in this building this morning or whether we are online, my prayer is that we, in everything that we do, everything that we say, that we are praising the name of Jesus. God, my hope and my prayer for each of us is that we know that despite what we may see, despite what we may feel, despite what things may look like, that you are a God that is worthy of our praise. So God, I hope and pray for each of us this morning, again, that this would be so much more than a few songs that we may sing, and now we sit down and we hear a message, but God, my hope and my prayer as that this is a desire of our hearts and our minds to change, to be different, and in everything that we do, to praise the name of Jesus. So God, my heart and my prayer in the remainder of this time is that you would speak to us each in our place today, that we would hear from you, we would reflect on the word that you lay on our hearts and minds. God, we pray all this in your holy precious and your powerful name. Amen. a few years ago that we had signed our son Mac, Jen and I, we had signed him Mac up for a, a local rec soccer team. And so we showed up to the first practice, met the coach, seemed like a really nice guy. And then throughout the season, Jen and I, you know, before and after games, we would, you know, have conversations with the coach and his wife. And we got to know them over the course of that season and really, you know, enjoyed being around them. So Jen and I, towards the end of the season, we said, hey, why don't we invite him over for dinner? So we did that, they, their entire family, they came over for dinner, and we, we hung out, we had pizza together, and just enjoyed the time, and then at some point during the night, uh, this coach, he, he asked me the question that I hate to be asked. He said, well, what do you do? And the reason I hate that question is because so often my answer to that question makes people act weird. Like I'll, people will ask me that question, I've had people go into complete confession mode, well, they'll start confessing, well, you know, this is what I'm doing, and well, this was, isn't why I'm going to church, and uh, so I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh, I, I don't keep track of any of that kind of stuff, and that's not, that's not what I do, but they automatically assume that they need to confess something to me, or, or they get weird and just not sure how to even relate to me. They think that all I do is pray and read my Bible, and, and that is my entire life. But it was amazing as that uh, couple, they asked that question, and I responded, well, I, I'm a pastor. They didn't leave. <laughs> they didn't leave. And what's even more amazing is that a few weeks later, guess what? They invited us over to their house for dinner. Hey, they like us. And you know what? I appreciate that relationship so much over the last few years because we've gotten to know them and consider them good friends. And here, here's, here's what's interesting, though. That you know this, maybe, that the longer you're a Christian, the more you end up having friends that believe what what you believe, or, or their kids 
Um, they raise their kids the way that you raise your kids or their marriages are similar to their marriage, your marriage. So the longer you're a Christian, the more you'll find that most of your friends are Christians. But here's what I hope for you. What I hope is that you have people in your life that like you, but don't necessarily want to be like you. I hope you have people in your life that want to be around you, but don't necessarily believe what you believe. That maybe don't raise their kids the way you raise your kids, or maybe their marriage isn't like your marriage. Maybe they're not even married at all, or they don't handle their finances, or don't spend their time doing the things that you do. I hope there are people that like you that have no desire to be like you. And why would I say something like that? It's because Jesus, Jesus, that he had people that were nothing like him that always wanted to be around him. And they always wanted to be around him because of the way that he treated them and the time he took to spend with them. And so I hope that you have people around you that like you but don't necessarily want to be like you. And the reason is because that's the way Jesus was and it's what our Heavenly Father does. That everybody matters to God, even if God doesn't matter to them. That's how our Heavenly Father is. In fact, in John 3, 16, maybe you remember, if you grew up in church, you memorized that verse as a child, right? John 3, 16 says, for God so loved only the people that loved him back. For God so loved only a certain group of people that lived a certain way. No, no, no. It was God so loved the world. God so loved the world that no qualifications. He loved the world, and it says that he gave. That he gave. So you and I, as we imitate our Heavenly Father, we're called to love people that may not love us back. We're called to love people that may not believe what we believe. But here's the problem. That as Christians and sometimes as the church, we have not always treated people very well. That over time, you know, Christians have been labeled as judgmental and hypocrites. That you might not be a believer this morning. You're kind of tuning in and not sure what you feel about Jesus or how you feel about the church. And, and maybe that's why you even left the church or maybe why you never wanted anything to do with Christians. But the truth is this, is that people matter to God. And we know that it's because what Jesus taught. That Jesus taught this idea that every single individual has inherent value. That every single human being has inherent value. And that value isn't because of wealth. It's not because of your last name. It's because you're made in the image of God. And so we believe that. I think we believe that in our culture and today within the church. We believe that every person has value. But you have to understand that in Jesus' day, that idea that we're kind of used to, that idea was a completely brand new idea. And so over the last few weeks, we've been looking through this message that Jesus preached. He had a crowd gathered around, and what he began to do is he began to paint a picture of what he came to do in the kind of kingdom that he came to establish. And it's in this message that he shares something, I think, helps us frame, helps us understand what we're called to do and how we're called to live as believers, especially how we're called to love people that might not love us back. And so this is what he says. In verse 42, he says, give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. And I'll just say what you might be thinking at this point. Okay, give to those who ask, what if they can't pay me back? Right? Jesus, listen, I'm sure that's the nice thing to do, but what if they can't pay me back? Jesus, what if they take advantage of me? What if he takes this money or takes this item, you know, I loaned him something. What if he takes it and has no intention of ever paying me back? What if she takes the money and loses it all? And I can't get it back. Jesus, what about that? And Jesus would respond, and I think he'd say, well, that's okay. In fact, in fact, that's, that's perfect. No, 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 Jesus, that's not perfect you know, that, that's a problem because I just lost out on that money or I just lost out on that thing that I let them borrow. But Jesus, I think, would push back again and say, well, then you need to understand why I came. And so in the next verse, in verse 43, he says, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate 
your enemy. And Jesus, as he makes that statement, what he was doing, he was confronting one of the major ways of how people thought in that culture in the first century. There was a general Jewish idea of thought that, you know what, it's okay to hate your enemy. But the problem with that was that God never said it's okay to hate your enemy. But for the Jewish people throughout their history, and you look at some of the stories from the Old Testament, God had this desire that his people would not be like the rest of the world around them. In fact, throughout Jesus' time, as he walked the earth, one of the big issues that the Jewish had, or the big people groups that the Jewish people couldn't stand, were the Samaritans. They were mentioned several times throughout the four accounts of Jesus' life. And the Jews hated the Samaritans because the Samaritans were half Jews. That they were Jewish, but yet they had intermarried with other cultures and other religions. And so they had, in so many ways, compromised their Jewishness. And so the Jews hated Samaritans. And it was just assumed that that was okay to do. It was generally accepted that you could hate your enemy. It was understood that, hey, you can love the people that love you back, but you could hate the people that weren't like you. You could hate the people that didn't live to the standards that you lived to. You could hate a certain group of people or a certain social class of people or a group of people that just didn't believe what you believed. And so Jesus, he comes on the scene in the midst of this culture that the general assumption was, hey, you can treat your enemies any way you want to treat them. You can just hate people that aren't like you. And so Jesus makes a statement and he says, you have heard the law that says, he says, you have heard it said that everybody's told you that it's okay to hate your enemy. But he says, they're wrong. Well, Jesus, this is what I was taught growing up. This is what, how it's always been. And, and I was taught these things. And no, Jesus said, well, okay, but, but that's wrong. That you were taught wrong. In fact, your heavenly father never, ever said that. He says, he continues in verse 44, he says, but I say, but I say, I got something new for you. Love your enemies. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus, come on. Jesus, that's ridiculous. You cannot expect us to love our enemies and pray for the people that persecute us. Because who would do that? Who would love their enemies? Jesus, who would pray for their enemies? Jesus, we, we hardly pray for anybody but, but ourselves. You know, I, I don't even know if I pray for my friends all that often. If, right, if God answered every one of the prayers that you've prayed over this last year, the, the people that would benefit most from the prayer would probably be you and your family. So who would pray for their enemies? Jesus. And think about the people that you would put in that category. Think about the... People that you would say, oh, that's an enemy. People that seem to have it out for you at work. Or maybe you were bullied at school. Or maybe you think of your enemy, it's that neighbor that doesn't take care of their lawn. And every time, and every time you walk in and out of your house, you see it and it makes your blood boil. That's, <laughs> that's your enemy. Pray for them, Jesus. Pray for them. Or maybe you're in middle school or you're in high school and you're thinking, you know what, my enemy? My enemy is my parents. And you're right. As parents, listen, we lay in bed at night and we think to ourselves, you know, what can we do? Oh, what can we do to make our children's lives as miserable as possible? I know, I know. We can hate their friends. Oh, we can put filters on their their internet access. Oh, we can give them screen time and we can limit what they do. Oh, that's it. You know, whoever persecutes you, Jesus is saying, I want you to pray for them. But who would do that? Normal people don't do that if Jesus would say, well, this is what I came to do, that that I'm actually turning the world upside down and I'm asking you to follow me. But have you thought about that? What if you did love your enemy? What if you took the time to, to pray for your enemy, to pray for those who persecute you? What if you did that for a month? What if you did that for a month? Do you know that your attitude towards that person would change if you prayed for them every single night? If you prayed for that manager at work that always seems to have it out for you, if you prayed for them every single day for a month, your attitude would change towards that person. Your attitude would change towards towards that friend who humiliates you in front of all your friends. Your attitude would change for that mom who said whatever she said about your kids or however she judged you and how you raised your kids, that that neighbor, oh, 
What have you prayed for that neighbor whose dogs don't stop barking? And I'm not saying pray that they'll finally get what they deserve and those dogs, something might accidentally happen to them. No, 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 no. Not that kind of prayer. But really pray for them. Do you know whose attitude you would begin to mirror? Your Heavenly Father. If you prayed for somebody that you might put in that category of an enemy or somebody that has persecuted them, if you prayed for them, you would begin to feel for them what your Heavenly Father feels for them. That if you pray for that person until you feel for them what your Heavenly Father would, Jesus would say, this is what I want from you. I know this is brand new, but this is what I want. If you're going to follow me, I'm calling you to something difficult. I'm calling you to something that is not normal. I'm calling you to something that might actually turn your relationships upside down. That might actually turn how you interact with other people completely upside down. He continues in verse 45. He says, in that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives us his sunlight, he gives sunlight, his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. He says, you'll be like children of your father in heaven. If you live this way, if you make this choice to pray for those that persecute you and love your enemy, guess what? You'll be like your, your father in heaven, right? Like father, like son. Like father, like daughter. You want to be like your father in heaven, you have to do what your father in heaven does because he says, this is what your father in heaven does. Like it or not, your father in heaven, he causes the sun to rise on people that are good and people that are evil. Like it or not, here's what your heavenly father does. He causes it to rain on the fields of those that are good and those that are evil and maybe even in your eyes, don't deserve it. This is how your Father in heaven handles things. Do what he does. He's telling us to bless those that bless you and bless those that don't bless you. <laughs> and you might push back and say, what kind of perfect little church world are you living in? Because that just doesn't work in the real world, right, Laren? You're working one day a week and all you're ever around is other Christians. You have no idea because my boss or my ex-wife or my ex-husband or my parents and because of something that they did or they said or something that happened, you know, I haven't talked to them in years. Listen, don't shoot the messenger because this is what your heavenly father's son has asked of us. And you think about it. That what Jesus is asking us to do, that at one point it changed the world. At one point, doing this very thing changed the world. The world wasn't changed by all the messages that Jesus preached. Because what we know is that the world was changed because a group of people embraced the things that Jesus taught and did what their heavenly father would do. And so, in verse 46, he challenges, he pushes this even farther. He says, if you love only those who love you, what reward is there in that? Because even corrupt tax collectors do at least that. And to put this in a frame of reference for us today, think, think for a moment. Think for a moment the worst category, the worst group of people that you can even think about. Now, we don't have tax collectors today, but, but what is that group of people, that category of people that you would look at them and say, you know, they, they, they're horrible people, the people that live that way, they're, they're, they're no good, they're evil, that group of people that you would classify, you know, in, in some ways as a tax collector. I tend to lean towards Ohio State fans, and I put them in that category. But think about the worst kind of person that you can think about. Don't, don't you think that that group of people, as horrible as you might think they are, don't you think that they treat well the people that treat them well? Wouldn't you expect that they're probably good to the people that are good to them? That's the point Jesus is making. If the worst people that you can think of, that worst category that you can think of, the type of person they are, if, if they will treat each other well, then, then you're no better than them. He says, look, even the tax collectors do that. Even the fill in the blank do that for each other. 
He's just saying, listen, you're not better than they are if all you do is do good for those that do good for you. Verse 47, as he continues, he says, if you're kind to only your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Because even people that don't believe in God do that. If you're only kind to your friends, you're acting like everybody else. You see, but what Jesus is doing, he's saying, hey, I want you to do something that's just, it's not natural. I want you to do something that's uniquely Christian. Aren't people who don't care about God, aren't they still kind to their friends? And if you only lean towards people who are like you, come on. I mean, that's what everybody else does. And Jesus is saying, I want you to follow me. And so I actually want you to do more than others do. And what everybody else is doing, I want you to do more. I want you to do more. And if you do, if you do this, if you pray for them, if you treat them like your heavenly father treats them, that this becomes a habit of your life, that this kind of behavior characterizes you as a follower of Jesus Christ. In the, ver in the next verse, in verse 48, he says this. He says, but you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. He's saying, if you do this, you can be perfect like your heavenly Father in heaven is perfect. And I just, I just want you to think about this, that there are Jewish religious leaders probably sitting in the crowd that day, and when they heard this, oh, they couldn't handle it. They hated that Jesus thinks he could make a statement like this. Hold on, because you can't be perfect like God. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Yes, you can. Within this context, you can be just like your heavenly father. Not just like your heavenly father because you never make mistakes. And you can be like your heavenly father not because you never sin. But in this case, as you live this out, you can be perfect just like your heavenly father. Just like your heavenly father. And Jesus, he's, again, he continues to push us. He says, I want you to evaluate your life. To evaluate it in the context of how you treat other people. And not just treat the people that treat you right. I want you to actually do good for those who cannot or will not do good for you. He says, this, this is what it's like to be like God. If you do this, <laughs> you can be perfect like God. He didn't say, pray and you'll be perfect. If you'll just pray all the time, then you'll be perfect. And he didn't say, if you'll just read, all, read your Bible every day, well, then you'll be perfect. He didn't say, if you'll go to church and, and attend a Bible study, well, then you'll be perfect. He says, do this, care for, love, pray for, and serve. That's what God-likeness is like. It's about doing these things. It's about doing for others who cannot and will not do for you. It's about loving people who cannot or will not love you. And here's the benefit in all of this. This is, this is where it gets good for you. When you and I, when we decide to treat people well, I do well, you do well, then when you treat people better, it's better for us. Because it's in that choice that we, in our lives, live in a way that makes us more like God our Heavenly Father. Because this is what Jesus did. I mean, some of the things that Jesus did defy, defy normal human being understanding. I mean, think, think about the time that Jesus healed a Roman centurion slave. I mean, the Jews hated the Romans. The Romans were a daily reminder that God was punishing them, and so they hated anything to do with Rome. And a Roman centurion, a Roman soldier goes up to Jesus and says, listen, Jesus, my slave is sick. Can you do something? Can you heal him? And Jesus, he looked at this man who represented a group that would one day down the road would crucify him, and he said, sure, I'll do that for you. At one point, Jesus looks at a tax collector named Matthew who write, wrote down this very story and said, Matthew, I want you to come and follow me. There was a woman that was caught in adultery, and she was brought by some of the religious leaders to Jesus right in front of the temple, that place that was holier than any other place, that place where God would come and dwell at times. And Jesus looks at her, 
and says, I forgive you. Jesus fed crowds of people that would, that, crowds of people, many of whom would at one point later down the road shall crucify him. Jesus healed complete strangers that never came back to say thank you. And, and if that isn't enough to prove to you what Jesus calls you and I to do, if that isn't enough, just the fact that Jesus died for your sins and died for mine tells me that you and I are called to do good for people that cannot or will not do good for you. It means that you and I are called to love people who cannot or will not love you back. And this is what it means to be godly. That while we may be criticized for what we believe, we should be famous for how we treat other people. Because that's exactly what Jesus did, and it's what our Heavenly Father calls you and I to do. Because, you know what? People might look at us as followers of Jesus Christ and think, what? You believe that somebody rose from the dead? How do you believe that? That's crazy. There might be people that look at you and think, you believe in this magic book that God spoke to people? That's crazy. People might look at you and say, you know what? You, you really, how, how do you in the world, do you believe that Jesus is going to appear again? There are going to be people that look at you and think, I don't even understand that. But you know what? Those people sure know how to treat other people well. Well, I don't believe what they believe, and I don't know how they believe what they believe, and I really don't want to be one, but I'd sure like to hire one, or I'd sure like to work for one, or I'd sure love it if my kids married one. I'd sure love it. I don't believe what they believe, and I don't know how they believe what they believe, but I sure hope that they move into the neighborhood because they're some of the finest people in our community. I don't believe what they believe, and again, I, I don't know how they can even believe some of that crazy stuff, but I sure wish that every public school in our community had a church, had a group of people, Christians like that, that poured in to that school. <laughs> and I get it. There are going to be people that don't get us. And we have, in some cases, the church Christians have earned a reputation. And we haven't always done well in loving other people. But what I know is that Jesus was famous for how he treated other people. And he says to you and I, come and follow me. Come and follow me. And this is how I want you to love and care for people that might not love and care for you. And people that might not believe what you believe, and people, and people that, that want to have nothing to do with what you believe. And the thing is, is that we know from history that loving in this way and caring for people in this way has the potential to change the world because it's happened before. And so here's where we're at. You know, this fall... It makes me sad because usually this time of year we're gearing up for our back to school bash with our school partner, McConnell Elementary. Usually at this time of the year we're preparing, we're having meetings with our mentors that are going to mentor students in this upcoming year that just, you know, need some adults that will take some time out and invest in them. This time of the year we're usually kind of gearing up for our backpack program. We've got our plan clear it, it, you know, we know exactly what we're going to do this year. We've got all of our dates on the calendar, and we're ready to go. But this pandemic and school being virtual has, has changed everything for us. Now, I know that the backpack program will continue, and we'll adjust and, and make sure that kids get food on the weekends during the school year. But I don't exactly know what the mentor program would look like. But I also know that there are students at McCons Elementary that need other adults to invest in them because of what they're not getting in their homes. That they just need an adult to invest in them. You know, I don't know what it looks like to have a back-to-school bash this year. 
And I don't know what it looks like for us as we try to care for teachers at McConts Elementary and even other schools as we have done in years past. We have no idea what it looks like. But I can tell you this. As a church, we're going to make the choice to love and care for people around us that might not believe what we believe. We're going to make the choice to love and care for people around us that might not normally ever walk through the doors of our church. But we're going to choose to love and care for our community. We're going to choose to walk through the doors that God has opened for us. And we're going to do that because that's what our Heavenly Father would do. We're going to do that because that's what Jesus taught us to do. And so we're going to serve and love because our Heavenly Father has asked us to. And so again, I have no clue exactly what this fall looks like as we make the choice to love and serve other people. But right now, I invite you to walk forward in this with us. That as we're putting together plans, as we're working with the school, figuring out what mentoring looks like, figuring out what the back-to-school bash looks like, figuring out what it means to serve the teachers and staff and invest in them and care for students, as we're, we as a church staff, as we're figuring this out, I invite you to walk forward with us, to say, you know what, I'm in. I'm all in. That I, God, I need God to use me. I want God to use me. I want to do what my Heavenly Father would do. I'm all in. And a simple thing that you can do right now in this moment, right? I get it. You're in your home, and you're thinking of what this school looks like, school year looks like for your kids or your family or, or what this looks like for your job. Right now, I'd love for you just to say, you know what? I'm in. Use me however I can help. To take a moment and text the word 4AB, 4AB to the number 586-200-1785. And by doing that, you're not committing to anything. We're not signing you up to, to be a mentor without any conversation, without any choice. We're not signing you up to help out with a back-to-school bash or whatever we may do this year. But, but you're saying, hey, I want to be involved. Help me find a place. Use me because I want to love people that might not love me back. And I want to care for people that might not care about what I care about. But this is what my Father, Heavenly Father has called me to do. And this is what Jesus taught me to do. And so count me in. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I, I pray for wisdom in this coming school year that I have no doubt that as uncertain as this year is, that I am certain that you will continue to see your will done. And I'm certain that you will use us as a church, as individuals, as we infiltrate, as you use us in the walls of the schools that you have opened the doors to, God. I know that you're going to use us in some powerful ways. And I don't know what it looks like. But as a church, we're going to trust you as we move forward. And so I pray for your guidance and your wisdom that you would allow us to do what you've called us to do. To love those that might not love us back to care for those that might not believe what we believe. And so, God, we're going to step forward into this because it's what you've called us to do. And we love you. Amen. Thanks again for joining us for Church Online this morning. We are so glad that you have decided to worship with us. Remember, if you have yet to connect with us, go ahead and text the word CONNECT to 586-200-1785. And we would love to see you in person here at our Chesterfield campus, either at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings. And as you go this week, would you passionately pursue God and relentlessly reveal Jesus to the world around you? Have a great Sunday.